Good morning, Eastgate. Would you stand with us as we prepare to worship this morning? I love your voice. You 
have led me through the fire and in darkest night you are close like no other i've known you as a father i've known you as a friend and i have lived in the goodness of god all my life sing it out and all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that i am made oh i will sing of the goodness of god your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down surrender now i give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am made, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Good morning. morning. Caught me off guard. I was in the back running my mouth. Imagine that. (laughs) Y'all don't have to say amen. That's okay. James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you, you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not liking anything. So you know what? If you're going through a rough time right now, if you've had a rough week, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's not finished with you yet. Amen. Announcements this week. Wednesday night groups are 7 p.m. every Wednesday and available on Zoom during men's group and Facebook Live is offered for women's group. Sunday morning groups are at 930. Zoom is also offered for the sanctuary class. Uh, was not up and running this this morning for some reason we had a glitch um, Sunday morning children's church is offered now for toddlers for ages toddlers through fifth grade Sunday morning service is offered in person and also on Facebook live so good morning to everyone on Facebook live prayer time at the altar is at 9 a.m. every Sunday morning please observe appropriate distancing and possible if it possible please wear a mask and if you guys are not here for Nine o'clock prayer time, you're missing a blessing. Let me tell you, it's a good way to start your day. Celebrate Recovery is at 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. every Friday night. The food pantry is uh, currently collecting soup cans, uh, cans of soup for the uh, month of October. And also we are from now until January collecting coats and blankets for the rescue mission. Cold weather's coming on. We need to take and bless others as we've been blessed. Amen. Last reminder, offering plates are at each exit for those that would like to give this morning. And for those online, there should be a link being shown now under my name for those that want to give online. At this time, I will ask Mike Rudd to come up with an announcement. Can the church say amen? amen? Can God's people say praise the Lord? Praise, praise Lord. the Lord. Uh, what was that? <laughs> brother Ray you got it brother all right next Sunday pastor appreciation don't forget that we want to be a blessing to all of our pastors 
We have six pastors. So we have boxes at the back where you can put your cards, your gifts, whatever. We want to be a great blessing to our pastors. Uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Praise his holy name. Can somebody tell me what I'm holding up here? That's the Bible. My son, who passed in uh, July, when he was little, he used to say, my Marlin, my Marlin. And he used to say to me, say, my daddy, 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 my daddy, daddy, daddy. I love my son, you know, and I miss my son. But I was thinking about when he was about maybe six or seven years old. See, I wasn't the first one to take him to church. His grandmother was. And at six or seven years of, old, of age, uh, he came home and he sang a song to me. He said, the B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. I stand upon the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. This is our road map to heaven. You know what? When you're hungry, he is the bread of life. When you're thirsty, he is the water of life. When you're lonely, I'm going to tell you what, he is one, the word of God said, that sticketh closer than a brother. He is our everything. If you got a prayer request this morning, let's take it to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lift up your hearts to the Lord this morning. Praise your name. Heavenly Father, first of all, we give praise unto you. We give thanksgiving to the God that made us. Father, we love you with all of our hearts, and we know, Father, that you are our everything. And we know you're giving us your word as a road map that will lead us on to heaven. It will lead us every step of the way. Heavenly Father, I come to you, ask you, hear, would you please hear the prayers of your children this morning? Please hear and touch every heart this morning, Father. Touch us at our need, Heavenly Father. Please meet us at that need. Heavenly Father, we pray most of all this morning that you continue to bless the singers, and the musicians, Father, as they lift up your word this morning in song. But, uh, Heavenly Father, most of all, we ask that you please, Father, touch the man of God as he brings forth the word of truth from the B-I-B-L-E. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray. And all God's people say it together, amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we continue to worship this morning? This is one of my favorite all-time hymns and it just says blessed assurance blessed assurance Jesus is mine oh what a foretaste of glory divine Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Sing it out. This is my story. This is my story. And this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture that burst on my side, angels descending, drink from my blood. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story. So this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Oh, this is my story. 
that last line of praising my Savior all the day long. Is that what you want to do this morning? Praise our Savior all this day long. That's right. Give him praise. There is power in the name of Jesus. Oh, there is power in the name of Jesus. Oh, there is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Sufficient sacrifice, so freely given, such a price for our redemption. Heaven's gates swing wide. There is power. In the name of Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain. There's an army. There's an army rising up. There is an army, yes. There's an army rising up. I said, There's an army, yes. Rising up to break every chain. To break every chain, there is an army. There's an army rising up. I said, There's an army, church. There's an army rising up. There is an army, yes. Rising up to break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Amen. 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 Amen.
Amen. Amen. Are you ready to be in God's house? Are you glad to be here today? Amen. Well, we're glad to see you this morning. We're excited about the series that we've been in looking at Daniel, and we've been looking at the life of Daniel for the last few weeks, and um, about three weeks ago, we started this series, we started looking at Daniel and talking about what it means to have an unshakable faith, Amen. that there's a lot of times in life that you're going to go through circumstances, you will go through situations, there are going to be things in life that's going to come that's going to shake you to the core, and where are you going to place your faith? And then as we opened up the book of Daniel in week two, we really began to look at Daniel's life and what was going on in Daniel's life at this time. And uh, at this time in history, the Israelites had continually walked away from God. And for years, the prophets have been prophesying and saying, hey, there's going to come a time when you're going to go back into captivity. God said there's going to be punishment for your apostasy. You've walked away. And Daniel, about the age of 15, was taken into captivity by the Babylonians. At 15 years of age, Daniel and a lot of his friends were taken away and they were placed in the king's palace. And at the king's palace, they were to be indoctrinated over a period of time for several years. They were to learn a new language. They were to learn the history of the country of Babylon. They were to learn all the traditions, all the culture of Babylon. And one of the things they said, they were eat of the food of the king's table. And week, in that week, on week two, we talked about how Daniel and his three friends, who was later named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these four men said, hey, we don't want to eat of the food of the king's table. And there's a reason they don't want to eat of the food of the king's table. They said, we do not want to defile our bodies. You see, they understood that the food that would come from the king's table, now I want you to understand something, they were getting the best taste in food in the world. But sometimes the best taste in food is always not the best food for us. Can I get an amen? Just go get on the scales, you'll say amen twice. That's not always the healthiest thing for us. But also a lot of this food had been prepared for idols, for false gods, and they said, we do not want to defile ourselves we believe in the one true God. Now, I want you to know, there was a lot of other Hebrew boys there, a lot of other young guys that were there, and they said, hey, you know, everybody else is doing it. You might as well do it too, Daniel. But Daniel said, I will not defile my body, and he asked for special permission not to eat of the food of the king's table, and he was granted permission. They said, for a 10-day test, we don't want anything but vegetables and water. And after 10 days, they came out looking healthier and better than all the other guys there. And he found favor in the eyes of the king. And then after 15 years of age, this has just happened about two years later, this king has a dream. We talked about it last week. Nobody in the kingdom could understand the dream, and nobody knew the dream. The king said, you know what? If you can't tell me the dream... And also interpret it. He said, I'm going to have every magician, every enchanter, every fortune teller. He goes, every person who should be able to tell me what this dream is in the meeting. He goes, every one of you guys are going to be killed. And if you remember last week, Daniel said, may I have some time to go and pray. And Daniel went back home to his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they hit their knees and they were praying. And through the night, Daniel had this vision. And God revealed to Daniel not only what the dream was to come and tell the king, but also the meaning. And Daniel, once again, was promoted in the kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar said, there's no God like Daniel's God. And Daniel said, if you don't mind, would you also promote my three friends right here who have been faithful? Yet Daniel stayed in the royal palace, and we're going to pick up in chapter 3 today of Daniel. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 3, and... In Daniel chapter 3, we don't really know where Daniel's at, to be honest with you right here. Uh, we're looking at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. More than likely, Daniel was probably off on royal business or somewhere else. He's not mentioned in this story that we're going to be talking about today. But we're going to be talking about what happens when the heat of life is put on you. You see, we're talking about thriving in the test of life. Now, I want to tell you something. In the world that we live in, not a whole lot's changed from then until now. The enemy's always attacking, and Satan's doing everything he can to try to defeat you. 
If you have your Bibles, open to Daniel chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. The scripture reads this way. King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue, 90 feet tall and 90 feet wide. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messengers to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come and dedicate the statue that he had set up. So all these officials, they came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted out, People of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. Whenever you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, zither, lyre, harps, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow down to the ground and worship King Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will be immediately thrown into the blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bow down to the ground and worship the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. You see, I want to tell you what, there's a lot of similarities in our society today that happen just like it was happening right here in this culture. And, and if you have your outlines this morning, and uh, those of you, if you're here for the first time or you haven't given us your email address every week, since we don't have regular bulletins that are being printed out, we send out an outline every week of the message, the sermon notes, and if you like that, uh, make sure you see uh, me or one of our staff, and we'll add you to that list. You can have the sermon notes to write them in. If not, they'll be on the screens for you. But I want to talk a little bit about today about the similarities today that are very similar to right, right here in this passage of Scripture. First, your outline says this. The world creates larger-than-life images for me to worship. You see, we don't have images set up that are 90 feet wide and 90 feet uh, tall anymore of gold. But we have all kinds of things that we worship today. Think about the movie screens. The people go and they worship all these actors. Think about it for just a moment in sports arenas. How a lot of these athletes think that they're larger than life. And so many people follow and they flock after them. And they, they chase after all these athletes. And you have concerts with lights and smokes and mirrors and all these different things. You see, the idols that we have today are not the same but they're very similar. You say, oh, Pastor, what do you mean? You see, they're not these big physical statues, but we worship physical beauty. We worship images, money, success, pleasure. We worship power, influence, popularity. You see, we have all these images that we set up in our lives, and we still worship them. If I can make this much money, I can do this. If I can look like this, then I can do this. If I have this status, then everything will be okay. And we set up these images that we worship. And can I tell you something, parents? We do that a lot for our children as well. We want our kids to act this way, to look this way, to do this, to do that. And we set up images for them. We set up images in our own life all the time, and we begin to worship those things as they're the most important thing in our life. We're not much different. The second thing in your outline says this, I'm tempted to create a false image of myself to impress others. Think about that for just a moment. We're always trying to be something that we're not. Think about social media. Every picture has a filter. Every picture has to be our very best. Everything that we put out there, we want people to see us in a different light, and we've always got to be keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak. I've got to have a car like their car. I've got to have clothes like their clothes. They just did this to their lawn. I've got to do this to my lawn. They added this, so I've got to add that. We've always got to be keeping up with somebody. We have this image to uphold. And all of a sudden, building this image quickly becomes idol worship. We're worshiping the things around us. Life is not about God. Life becomes about us and keeping up with everybody else. 
We hear it all the time that image is everything. But the truth of the matter, that's a lie straight from the pits of hell. As a matter of fact, the most important thing in your life is not your image, but it's the character of who you are. You see, people idolize themselves. And they're constantly thinking about themselves. When it's all about me and it's never, never about others, you know, we begin to live in this life of a selfish attitude, kind of like this king did. He said, you know what, I'm going to build this huge image because I'm larger than life, he said. He said, and I want everybody to bow down and worship this image. You know why they worship this image, he said? Because I want everybody to worship me. And that's exactly what King Nebuchadnezzar was thinking. Number three in your outline says this. If I reject the world's idols, people will try to burn me. If I reject the world's idols, people will try to burn me. In verses 8 through 12 it says, But some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue. When they hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all the other musical instruments, that decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the providence of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the golden statue you have set up. Now, I want to tell you what. There are probably a lot of different reasons why these guys didn't like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. One, they were foreigners. They were Jews. They were considered outcasts to a lot of the Babylonians. They had been placed in a place of authority, and they were living different from everybody else. Can I tell you something? When you're living a life different from everybody else, they feel it as a threat a lot of times. People say, oh, you think you're better than I am because you live this way or that way. You see, sometimes people's own personal convictions will make them angry with you. And see, these other guys said right here, they said, hey, it could have been out of jealousy. It could have been out of bigotry. It could have been out of fear. Whatever it was, they were not happy with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And can I tell you something? When you go against somebody else's way of thinking, a lot of times they're going to try to do everything they can to hurt you. They're going to demean you. They're going to talk down about you. They'll say things about you. I want you to always remember this. Little people belittle people. If somebody's belittling you, somebody's trying to hold you back, I want you to remember a lot of times it's because they're struggling with something in their own self-image. They're struggling with their self. The fourth thing says this. Doing the right thing always makes people angry. Even if you were perfect, the world would still be upset with you. Whenever you stand up for something, some people will always get mad. There's three types of people in life, and I want you, I want you to, to catch note of this. There are three types of people, and you probably work with some of them. They're called stuck-up, kiss-ups, or stand-ups. You're going to be one of the three. You're going to deal with these people all the time. Some people are stuck up. They think they're better than everybody else, that you're not good enough, and nobody will ever add up. If you walk in a high school for a couple of minutes, you're going to find out they're stuck up people. There's also kiss up people. You've been around them too. They try to do everything to make their self look better by putting somebody else down. You see, they have no goal of intention to making you better or anybody else better. It's all about me. Kind of like the stuck-up person. But then there are people who we call stand-up people. They really don't care what anybody else thinks. They're going to do the right thing no matter what. That's part of their character, and that's part of their integrity. They are who they are. You see, and these are the kind of people that we're going to face in life. So why did these guys stand up? Think about it for a minute. Everybody else would say, you know, hey, it's no big deal. We don't want to get thrown into the fire. God, you know my heart. Uh, I'm just going to bow down, but God, when I bow down, I'm going to pray to you because they're not going to know who I'm praying to. They could have easily justified in their minds what they wanted to do. They could have easily said, well, we'll do this, but why in the world would they stand up? Because you know what? They understood the word of God. And, and Mike, you couldn't have illustrated any better this morning, the B-I-B-L-E. 
The Bible is literally our roadmap to life. It is the living Word of God. And these young guys, at the age of 15, then at the age of 17, they stood up again with their buddy Daniel. And right now, this decree has been issued. They're a little bit older, and they're still standing on the Word of God. I want to tell you something. There was a reason these guys did not bow down. First of all, they would have understood the Ten Commandments, and they would have been breaking the first two if they did. First of all, the Scripture says, there shall be no other God before me. And I want you to understand something. In our culture, we're not a lot different from their culture. Because we're still building idols, the idol of money, that if I make this much money, I'll have success. If I date this type of person, then I'll be happy. And, and, and if I can do this in life, this will make my life much better. And if I look this way and I act this way, and we're constantly setting up idols in our life, and the scripture is very clear. It says, there shall be no other gods before me. Can I be real with you this morning? If you have anything in your life that you love more than God, that is your idol. If you're so busy that you can't serve God, that thing that keeps you so busy is your idol. And you say, well, pastor, it's my job. I've got to work. Yes, you do. But you've also got to set priorities. And keeping up with the Joneses is not a priority. If you don't have time to sit down and read the Word of God with your kids, something's wrong. If you don't have time to get on your knees and pray to God and to seek His face, something's wrong in your life. And I want to be honest with you, we've got idols set up in our lives. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, there's only one God. And they said, we understand this. And God, we love you more than anything. The second thing the Scripture says, do not make an idol for yourself. They said, King Nebuchadnezzar, you've already made this idol. And guess what? We're not going to fall to any idols. We're not going to worship any false gods, and we're not going to worship any idols that have been set up. In verses 13 through 15, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into rage. Have you ever noticed that when you go against what somebody else thinks, how they will fly into rage? If you don't believe it, just turn on the TV for about 30 seconds and watch one political commercial. Or you get on Facebook, and this side's fighting with this side. And the truth of the matter, what bothers me more than anything, is when we as Christians, when we get involved in all the mudslinging, you know what? We should be on our knees. Seeking the face of God. I'm going to keep going. The Nebuchadnezzar flew into rage, and he ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods and worship the golden statue that I've set up? He goes, this can't be right. He goes, don't you know who I am? That's what he's saying. He goes, it it can't be true. He goes, I I just want to hear this with my own ears. He goes, there's no way that you guys would do this. He said, I'll give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statues that I have made when you hear the sound of musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Nebuchadnezzar right here, he's having a God complex. As a matter of fact, he's getting ready to have a contest with the Almighty God. He goes, who can save you from me? He goes, who is your God? Who do you think you serve, Nebuchadnezzar? And can I tell you something? You need to ask yourself that question today. What God do you serve? Is your God able to save you when you go through the test and when you go through the fires in life? Because I'm going to tell you something. You are going to be put through the test in life. If you're not going through a test right now, can I tell you something? It's going to come. Life's going to happen. There are going to be circumstances and situations that are totally out of your control, and you're going to have to ask yourself, who am I going to trust? Am I going to trust myself? Am I going to trust other people? Or am I going to trust God? And this is exactly what's going on right here. And it brings us to this question. What should I do when the heat is on? Number one in your outline says this. Don't worry about defending yourself. In your life, people are going to attack you. 
They're going to attack your character. They're going to attack your integrity. When you're doing the right thing, people aren't going to be happy with you. In verse 16, it says, Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves in this matter. You see, they understood that God was going to defend them. When you're walking in integrity, and when you're walking with God, let me tell you something this morning. You don't need to defend yourself nor protect yourself. That's God's job. When somebody's attacking you, can I tell you something right now? Stop trying to defend yourself. You don't have to. As a matter of fact, the more you try to defend yourself, the worse it's going to be. Let God do his job. You walk in integrity and you walk upright. You seek after God and you follow him. Don't worry about defending yourself. You don't have to do it. God will. The second thing is, remember, God has the power to save me. In verse 17, the first part, it says, If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we worship, and I want you to circle this, is able to save us. You see, we may not be able to save ourselves, but God's always able to save us. King, you don't understand. We may not have power over you, but our God does. I don't care what situation you're going through right now. You may say, I can't save myself. There's nothing I can do to help myself. Can I tell you, we serve a God who is able. No matter what you're going through in life right now, I want you to think about the, whatever it is he's going through in your life right now, and you know exactly what that is. Every one of us walked in here carrying different burdens and walking through different situations in life. But one thing's for sure, we serve the one true God. And our God is able, no matter what your circumstance or situation is right now, you need to remind yourself, and you need to remind the enemy, my God is able. My God is able. The third thing says, believe that God will save me. And the second part of verse 17, it says this, he will rescue us, from your power, your majesty. Not only is there God able, but they said, he will rescue us. We believe that. You see, he says, everyone else may be conforming, yet these three guys right here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, said, we're going to stand up. You see, God will be with you when you go through the fires of life. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to go through fires in life. It may be at your job that your boss asks you to do something that you know is wrong. It may be in a relationship that you're in and you're getting pressured to do something that you know is wrong. It may be in a friendship. It may be in your marriage relationship. It may be at school. And you know that you're being asked to do something that is wrong. You have to stand up and you have to trust God. You're going to go through fires in life. In Isaiah 42, 43, verses 2 and 3, in the New Living Translation, it says, When you go through the deep waters... And get in great trouble. I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God. Now, I want you to understand something. It doesn't say if, but it says when you go through deep waters and great troubles. The scriptures right here is very plainly telling us there's going to be some time in your life that you will go through deep waters and you will go through great troubles. But listen to the promise of God. I will be with you. Can you say amen to that? Amen. I don't know about you, but that begins to excite me because when I'm going through deep waters and I'm going through troubles in life, God promised me this. This is right here in his word, and I know it's 100% true. You know why? Because Jesus Christ raised from the dead. The resurrection defeated death and it defeated hell, and my God's on the throne. I don't know about you, but I serve a big God. Can you say amen? Some of you guys need to wake up this morning because you're going to go through the troubles of life, but God says, I will be with you when you go through the rivers of difficulty. He goes, not if, but when. You're going to go through the rivers of difficulty. He goes, but you will not drown. Why? Because I'll be with you. When you walk through the fire of of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. He doesn't say that 
You're not going to walk through fires in life. You are going to face fires in life. The enemy is constantly throwing fiery darts at you all the time. He's always trying to defeat you, saying, you're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. You don't make enough money. You don't have enough. You don't look good enough. You don't do this right. You don't do that right. The enemy is constantly going to attack you. And it says, you will go through troubles, but I will be with you, for I am the Lord your God. I'm going to tell you what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had heard these words. They understood that they were going to go through the fires of life. They were going to go through the deep waters. But they also understood that they served a mighty God because from the time of their childhood, they had heard about how God had used Moses to deliver his people. They had heard about a God who had walked with them and promised to be with them. You see, their parents at some point had to invest in these young men. And I'm going to tell you what, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a very, very strong faith. The fourth thing says this. Announce your loyalty to God no matter what happens. They said our God's able to save us. But listen to verse 18. But even if He doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, Your Majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you've set up. They said, hey, I want you to understand something. That even if God doesn't save us here, He has a place for me in eternity. He will save us. That our God is able. We will never bow down to you because we serve the one true God. Our life is not in your hands, O King, but in the hands of an almighty God. There are three ways that God rescues us in life. And this isn't in your notes, but you want to write them down if you want to. You see, sometimes God will save us from the crisis. Sometimes God says, you know what? I know that right now you're not ready. You're not going to walk through this fire. And God will keep us. We'll avoid the fire. Sometimes God will simply save us from the crisis. Sometimes God will save you through the crisis. That you're going to walk through the fire. But you won't be burned up. Sometimes God saves us by the crisis. Keep in mind that God's calling us to an eternal home. And He's saving you from an eternal fire. You see, God's always going to save us, but it's going to be in the way He chooses. And they said, God, no matter what, we're going to serve you. God, no matter what the world says or no matter what these people try to do, God, we're going to serve you. Oh, King, I want you to understand that he says. We will never bow down to you nor any of your gods because we serve the one true God. And when we stand up like that, can I tell you what? People are going to be furious with their stance. Listen to verses 19 through 23. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the burning furnace. So they tied them up and they threw them into the furnace, fully dressed with their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king's anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw in the three men. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. You see, the more extreme your attacker, the more insecure they are. You see, when somebody else is attacking you, the more insecure they are. As I said, Little people, but little people. You see, and they said, this king was so angry. He said, I want this fire to be heated up seven times hotter than it normally is. 
You know, I kind of wonder if the king was a little bit insecure that maybe he was afraid that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God was going to save him. And he said, you know what? I'm going to make it a little bit harder on him. And then he had them bound up and tied by some of the strongest men. As a matter of fact, the furnace was so hot that as the guards came near the furnace, it killed them. So how do we have faith in the furnace? You see, you're going to face the furnaces of life. The enemy is not going to be happy with you when you're living for the Lord. I want to tell you that. You know, I, I talk with people, they say, you know, Pastor, I came to Christ, I thought life was going to be easier, and I always laugh. You're going to have more strength. You're going to have the power of God, not the power of man. But you see, when you start serving God, the enemy's not happy. He's going to do everything he can to attack you. But greater is he who is in me than he is who is in the world. Because you're going to receive a holy power that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit that can't be explained. And you know, when you go through the fires of life, you're not going to go through them alone. So what happens when I trust God in the furnace? First of all, God will walk through the fire with me. You see, you'll have the presence of God. I don't care what you're going through in life. The greatest thing that you can ever have is the presence of God. It's the greatest place you can be. You see, when you're in the presence of God, everything changes. Because in the presence of God, you also have the peace of God. The world may look at you and go, I don't know how in the world that you're going through the things that you're going through. How are you doing this? And you look at them and you say, it's not me. It's the God in me. You see, I want to talk to you a little bit about peace. And we mentioned this in Sunday school this morning. A lot of people are looking for peace, but they're looking for it in all the wrong places. Amen. You see, they're looking for peace in all the idols that they've set up in their life. Amen. If I can make this much money and I can buy this, this is going to make me happy, and this will give me peace. But it's a lie. You see, we think we can buy things that's going to make us happy, and we're happy, then we'll have peace, but it's so far from the truth. You see, I want you to catch this this morning, and a lot of you guys need to hear this about peace. First of all, the first peace we need in our life is the peace of God, and that only comes from God. You see, unless I'm at peace with God, I'll never be at peace with myself. You see, the peace of God comes through Jesus Christ when he died on that old rugged cross. And when I ask Jesus Christ to come into my life and he forgives me of my sin, then I can be at peace with God. Because I want to tell you what, if I'm not at peace with God, I'm at war with God. I want you to understand that. There is no in-between. God, I'm either for you or God, I'm against you. And so the peace of God is when Jesus Christ comes to my life and I have the peace of God. And then I, I have to have peace with myself. Because even though that I've been forgiven of my sin, and God says I have an eternal home for you, I still have this desire in my life that I have to do something with, this, this, this sin nature that says, you know what, I want what I want when I want it. And there has to come to a place when I come to a full place of surrender when I say, God, I want all of you, but God, I also want you to have all of me. God, I've got to surrender it all, God, because I don't want to be at war with you, God. I want to be at peace with you and at peace with myself. The only way that I can be at peace with myself, church, and I want you to understand this, is through the infilling and dwelling of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit takes control of my life, and I say, God, I want to live a Spirit-filled life, God. I'm tired of trying to do it on my own, God. I want my first thoughts to be your thoughts and not my thoughts. And we come to that place of surrender. So now I'm at peace with God. I'm at peace with myself. And I want you to catch this, church. You've got to understand this. You will never be at peace with other people until you're at peace with God and yourself first. I don't care how hard you try, it's impossible. You have peace in your life. You see, when I'm in the presence of God, I begin to understand something. I can't do it all on my own. God, I need you. 
Then all of a sudden, once I surrender, I say, you know what, God? It's not about me, it's about you. These guys, they understood something. King Nebuchadnezzar, we're not trying to show you any disrespect. As a matter of fact, we're trying to show you the one true God. And I want to tell you something. We're in the presence of God, and this is the greatest place to be. Now, this is the greatest blessing of God. I want you to understand this is the favor of God. If you remember, these young Hebrew boys were the same ones as, King, we will not defile ourselves with your food. We want nothing to do with the thing of the world. We want to be such uh, men of God that we're in the presence of God that people won't look at us, but they'll look at Jesus. Can I tell you something? They said, we will not defile ourselves with the things of this world. You know what that means in our culture today? I don't have to be like everybody else. As a matter of fact, I don't want to be like everybody else. I want to be like God. I want to be the person that God has called me to be. I want to defile myself with the junk of this world. All the things this world has to offer that are totally opposite of God. I don't want that. That was these same young boys, and the favor of God was placed upon them. It says they looked better, they were stronger, and they were wiser than anybody else in the kingdom. And all of a sudden, King Nebuchadnezzar saw that, and he promoted them. Then Daniel comes in, he's had this dream, and, and the king couldn't understand it. And Daniel and these three same boys, they seek the face of God, the hand of God, the presence of God is with them, the favor of God falls upon them. Daniel all of a sudden says, God, this dream has come from you and you alone. And God, not only did you tell me what the dream was, which was impossible for any fortune teller, we talked about that last week, how they're all fakes and frauds. And we talked about last week how to tell if they were true or not. They were not true, but the one true God gives Daniel the ability to know the dream, to understand and interpret it, and the favor of God was placed upon them again. Listen to what happened again. When the favor of God was placed upon them, they were promoted in the kingdom again. You know why? God had more kingdom business for them to do. This pagan, ungodly king, at that point, if you remember last week, he falls on the ground before Daniel and says, hey, let's burn incense before Daniel. This was a great man, and he serves a great God. He still didn't understand who God was. He knew Daniel served a great God, but he didn't really know God. And so these men were continuing to live a life of faith in the presence of God with the favor of God upon them in front of an ungodly king. And this king gets so angry. Can I tell you what? When you're living for God, the world's going to get angry. Satan's not happy when you're living for God. Why should we think they are? When people are living according to biblical standards, why do you think people get mad? Because they don't know God. You see, it's not a personal thing this way. It's a spiritual thing this way. They're not just fighting you, they're fighting God. And I want you to pick your battles and pick them wisely. You're not battling with that person, you should be on your knees praying for that person. Let God defend you, he'll take care of them. In verses 24 and 25 it says, Then suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped to his feet in amazement and asked the advisors, Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, we did, they said. Look now, he shouted. You can see four men now, unbound, walking around freely and unharmed. And the fourth man looks like the son of the gods. The fourth man is Jesus Christ himself. Didn't we only throw three men in there? God said, I will be with you when you go through the waters. I will be with you when you go through the fire. I will not be, uh, leave you alone, for I am your God. Can I get an amen this morning? I don't know what you're walking through in life, but can I tell you something? The enemy may be trying to be binding you up. He may be trying to make you walk through the fire. But God says, you're not going to walk through it alone because you're my child. And I, can I tell you something? When you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, the Scripture says that we're part of a royal priesthood. Woo! All of a sudden, I realized something. I've got royal blood running through my veins. I'm a child of the king, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. And oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, you're nothing compared to my king. And King Nebuchadnezzar, he jumps up and he leaps to his feet. He's in total amazement. No one can save you except my God, they said. You see, you're not alone. Can I tell you something? The only way that you can ever be alone is if you choose to put yourself in isolation. 
I want to tell you what, if you're going through something in life right now, I want to tell everybody here, please listen to me closely. If you're going through troubles in life and hardship, the natural thing for us to do is to isolate ourselves. I've seen it so many times. I've been pastoring at this church now for 21 years. Before I came here, I was in Lynchburg. And 20-something years of ministry. be 24 years of ministry, full-time ministry for my life. I've seen it over and over and over. When people go through struggles, the ones who isolate themselves always fall. Because you have no help. When you're going through the trouble of life, don't back away. Don't back away from the church. Don't back away from people. As a matter of fact, cling to them. Humble yourselves and say, you know what? I need help. You see, the enemy is going to say, well, people don't understand. You don't want to talk about it. You don't need to do this. And the enemy wants you to isolate yourself. Don't isolate yourself. Surround yourself. When you go through the hardest things in life, and I'm going to tell you, when I've been through the hardest things in life, the greatest thing has helped me has been the small group that I'm in. People praying for me, encouraging me, pushing me to Jesus. If you're not in a small group, you need to be in one. If you don't know how to get in one, come see me. I'll help you find one. You need that in your life more than anything. The second thing is this. God will burn off everything tying me down. Verse 25, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, look, I see four men unbound. You remember Nebuchadnezzar tried to tie them up? <laughs> We're not just going to burn you to death. We're going to tie you up. We're not going to give you any chance. The enemy's doing everything he can to try to bind you and to try to keep you. But they were walking around the fire unharmed. He said, the fourth looks like the God. One of the gods. You see, when we go through fire, can I tell you something about fire? Fire always refines us. God wants to remove any impurities and any junk from your life. When you're going through the fire, sometimes God just simply uses it as a refining process to purify you. And Isaiah 48.10, the New Living Translation says, I have refined you, but not in the way of silver that is refined. Whether I have refined you and the furnace of suffering. When we go through suffering in life, a lot of times, God is using that as a refining process. In the suffering of life, God is purifying you. Number three is, God will give you a new freedom. You see, the enemy is trying to always entrap us and to enslave us. But God wants to liberate you. God wants to give you freedom. What is it that holds you back in life? Are you worried about what people think? Is there a sin in your life that holds you back? God said, I came to set you free. In Psalm 66, 12, it says, You let captors set foot on your neck. Then we went through the fire and water, and you led us out of freedom. You see, God wants to lead you in a place of freedom. Number four says this, God makes sure I come out unharmed. In verses 26 and 27, it says, then Nebuchadnezzar, he came close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace. He couldn't get too close to remember how hot it was. And he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, the officials, the governors, the advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not even a hair on their heads were singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They did not even smell like smoke. Now, I want you to notice something. I think it's pretty amazing right here. Is the king, he gets close to the fire. He goes, I can't get so close to the fire because I don't want to get burned up. But then he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out of the fire. He didn't say anything to the fourth man. Could you imagine if he would have called God out of the fire? He couldn't have been able to stand it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out. And they said, you know what? Not a hair on their head was singed. Their clothing wasn't scorched. Listen to this. They didn't even smell like smoke. 
when you're living so close to God, you won't have the stench of sin upon your life. Remember a little bit earlier I said you didn't have to defend yourself? You see, this is what a holy life looks like. Those same men, those officers and officials and governors and advisors that came and said, hey, these young guys right here, they won't bow down to your image, king. They were the same ones who were standing by the king in astonishment. What could they say? Their clothes won't burn. They weren't scorched. They didn't even smell like smoke. Because they didn't have to defend themselves. God Almighty did. Number five said it will bring unbelievers to God. Listen to this response in verse 28. Then the king said, Praise the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel to rescue his servants. They trusted in him. They defied my command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any image except their own God. What are you willing to die for? Think about that for just a moment. You see, if we don't know what we're willing to die for, we don't know what we're willing to live for. People are always watching you. You see, new life comes when we go through the fire. Look at the new decree. You see, King Nebuchadnezzar recognized there was an almighty God. And when we go through the fire, there's always new life. Listen, here's his new decree in verses 29 and 30. Therefore, I make this decree. If anyone says anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be put to death and their houses will be destroyed. Now, this king right here, he's gone from having this God complex. If you don't worship me, I'm going to destroy you and kill you. To saying, you know what? If you don't worship the God of these three guys, I'm still going to have you destroyed. He's still got a little bit of a God complex here. But at least he's heading in the right direction. There is no other God who can save like this. Then the king, listen to what he did again. He promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego even higher positions in the providence of Babylon. Once again, these guys were living in the presence of God. And the favor of God had been placed upon them once again. This is the third time we see right here, these guys have been promoted to a different level. You want to know why? Because they served the one true God. You see, they had the favor of God upon them. These other guys wanted to be promoted as well. You see, these officials, these officers, they were looking at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and said, you know what, I want your job, so if you're dead, I'll have it. Think about it for just a moment. There are people who want your head on the platter, so to speak. I want what you've got, and I'll do whatever it takes to get it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, you know what, that's not who we are. That we're going to serve God no matter what. If you remember, it was Daniel last week when the king had set the decree to have all the magicians, the astrologers, all these people were to be killed. As soon as Daniel interpreted the dream and told the king the dream, he sent and he said, stop all the executions. Daniel just didn't care about himself, but he cared about other people. Once again, these guys were promoted. Lastly in your outline is this, number six. God will reward your faith. In 1 Corinthians 10, it says this. Excuse me, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15 says, Each of us must be careful how we build our lives because Christ is the only foundation. Whatever we build on that foundation will be tested by fire. If what we built is left standing... We will be rewarded. But if what we built is burned up by fire, we will lose our reward. Yet you will be saved like someone escaping 
from the flames. What are you building today? What is your legacy? You see, are you building up treasures here on earth? Or are you building up treasures in eternity? You see, you can't take anything from this world with you. But you can invest in souls for an eternity. You see, church, what has been your idol? What's been your God? What is it that you're struggling with? What is it that's grabbed the hold of you? You see, for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had a true fear there. We're getting ready to get thrown into the fiery furnace. Just before that, they were going to have their heads cut off because nobody could interpret a dream. What is it that you need victory from today? What is it that you're struggling with? Can I tell you something this morning? There's always victory in Jesus. But victory only comes when we're willing to give it up, give it to God, and trust Him. You see, there's some of you in here this morning, you need victories in your life. You need God's peace. As a matter of fact, you need the presence of God. You need the favor of God to be in your life, and you've been trying so long to do it on your own. But you need victory. There's a church, an old church uh, hymn that says, Victory in Jesus. This morning I'm going to ask Pastor Matt and our praise team to come up and play that song. And can I tell you where you find victory at this morning? We find victory on our knees at an altar saying, God, I need to give this to you. God, this struggle, this pain, this attitude, whatever it may be in your life that's grabbed the hold of you that's keeping you from having peace with God, maybe it's having peace with yourself or having peace with others. What's holding you back this morning? I'm going to ask that you would stand with us this morning. and As I pray, our altars are open this morning. and We welcome you to come and to seek the face of God. The other Father, this morning, we recognize that we're going to walk through fires of life, but we don't have to walk through them alone. Father, we recognize that there's one who's in the fiery furnace with us, and that's you, Lord. Father, I pray that this morning, whatever it is that's holding us back, that we would gain victory because there's victory in Jesus. Lord, this morning we want to give it all to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I heard an old, old story how my Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, then I repented of my sins and won the victory oh victory in jesus he's my savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me and i knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again. And cast the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, 
Come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus. He's my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew Him. And all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion that he has built for me in glory. I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angel singing and the old redemption story, and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, He's my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me and i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing Amen. Aren't you glad for the victory in Jesus? Amen. Let's pray together. The other Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you that no matter what fire we're going through, we can find victory in Jesus. Father, I pray that you would go before us today, Father God, that we may walk in your presence and your favor may fall upon us. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. And all God's people said together, Amen.